Hello, everyone, and welcome to this joint press conference organized by Media Central and the Jerusalem Press Club. My name is Talia Dekel, CEO of the Jerusalem Press Club, JPC. Thank you so much to our colleagues for facilitating this event. The list is long, so I won't get into them now. While some say that time heals, it is now obvious that time is, in fact, an enemy of healing. At JPC and Media Central, we've worked nonstop to provide the international press with access to sources in Israel for coverage of the ongoing war. After each event, we think we've heard or seen the worst there is, but unfortunately, as further testimonies of the gruesome massacre of 1,400 people in southern Israel by Hamas terrorists on October 7th come to light, the pain only worsens. With such high numbers of victims and the fates of many yet to be determined, including over 230 people kidnapped to Gaza, among them babies, children, teenagers, parents, grandparents, women, some of them pregnant, and men, it is no surprise that more and more stories continue to come out. Today, for instance, we learned that 18 survivors of the music festival slaughter are in psychiatric institutions. Today's webinar will deal specifically with one of the most horrific aspects of the attacks, which was not prioritized in the first weeks of the war, while Israelis were still coming to terms with the magnitude of the carnage. We will be focusing on the sexual nature of the attacks committed on October 7th, and we are joined by three experts on the issue who've paid deep, unimaginable prices to their mental health in order to bring attention to these crimes. They have agreed to talk about some of their work in the past five weeks because of the importance of the topic. Sherry, whose full name could not be shared under military guidelines, is an Israel Defense Force reservist who serves in a small unit within the religious department of the military that was formed a decade ago to assist with the ID and burial preparation of young female soldiers as more women join combat units in Israel. In the unfortunate case of a death or a mass casualty event, the unit is composed entirely of female soldiers who have undergone training, including those who have burial experience from civilian life. Since October 7th, the unit has taken part in the identification and burial preparation process of all female soldiers who were killed. Professor Ifat Biton is an Israeli law professor and activist. She is the president of the Ahava Academic College of Education and Science and the founder of Tmura, the, anti, the Israeli Anti-Discrimination Center, which advocates for the rights of female survivors of abuse. She was shortlisted for Israel's Supreme Court twice. Dr. Kochav El-Kayam Levi of the Department of International Relations at Hebrew University in Jerusalem is the chair of the Civil Commission on October 7th Crimes by Hamas Against Women and Children. The commission is a non-governmental body established in order to promote and assist in the investigation of war crimes committed against women and children by Hamas during the massacre and since then by holding women and children captive. Before we begin, I will warn listeners, particularly those joining from abroad, abroad with less of a background in covering this war, that while we do not plan on sharing graphic material, the, event, the events described by our, by our speakers are very disturbing and may cause secondary trauma. I now turn the microphone over to Executive Director of Media Central, Laura Cornfield, who will read a sample of testimonies collected by witnesses to the aforementioned crimes. It's important to note that there are many, many more still being discovered and that we've intentionally chosen just a few in order to provide context for the work being carried out by our speakers to follow. Laura, please go ahead. Thank you, Talia. Uh, I'd just like to say that as Talia mentioned, many of uh, the testimonies which I'm about to read to you are indeed very traumatic and very graphic. So if you find them too difficult, please feel free to just turn off my sound. And when Talia comes back on, she'll be introducing the next speaker. First-hand testimony of an eyewitness survivor reported by the police. They bent her over and I realized they were raping her one by one. Then she was passed over to another man in uniform. She was alive when she was raped. She was on her feet and bleeding from her back. He pulled her hair. He shot her in the head while he was still raping her. He didn't even lift his pants. They cut her breast and literally played with it on the street. They held up someone's head as a show of strength like a woman walking with a bag. Survivors of the Nova Musical Festival witnessed from their hiding places 
God, a survivor of the Nova Festival, told JTA News, for two hours I'm hiding and hearing people getting kidnapped and women getting raped. And without end, you hear people dying, begging for their lives, women begging for their lives. And you can't make a sound because they'll find you too, kidnap, kill you too. Another survivor told Tablet Magazine, women have been raped in the area of the rave, next to their friends' bodies, dead bodies. Several of these rape victims appeared have later been executed. Others were taken to Gaza. Hila Fakliro, a survivor of the Nova Festival, she told Sky News, I saw a video of my friend online that is naked and the terrorist is sitting on her and raping her and a lot of things like that. I will not tell you all the details of what I saw. Another survivor from one of the communities is given by a 94 year old grandmother, a Holocaust survivor. In the video, she cries that her granddaughter was abused and murdered right in front of her eyes. The grandmother is asking why was she spared while her young grandchild was slaughtered. The testimony of a female soldier, Lieutenant Tamar Bar Shimon, who survived the attack at the era's military base has testified that a Hamas man tried to take her clothes off. Another stopped him and they left the room in which she was hiding. Testimonies from investigation of Hamas, of Hamas terrorists. When asked, why did you take women? One terrorist answered, to have our way with them, to dirty them, to rape them. And why take the kids and babies, he was asked. To rape them, he answered. Another Hamas terrorist were asked, what were the plans for the abducted women? He answers, I'm telling you to whore them, rape them, hurt them and interrogate them. Whatever they feel like doing, they rape them, attack them. When asked if that included the babies that Hamas took captive, the, the man responded that Hamas raped them, abducted them, attacked them, killed them. Another Hamas terrorist confirmed that their actions included beheading people and having sex with dead bodies, including young women. According to the Mariv newspaper, one terrorist said he received permission from his religious leaders to murder children so that the children would not grow up as Jews. He also received permission to abuse women and their bodies in order to, in order to spread fear in Israeli society. Talia. Thank you, Laura. Uh, I've heard some of these testimonies myself before and it really doesn't matter how many times we hear them, they're just as difficult every time. Uh, I would like to point out that uh, the testimonies were gathered by the uh, by the non-government commission headed by uh, Dr. El Kayam Levy, and she'll talk more about that uh, when we when we get to her. Um, we'll begin with Sherry. Um, if you can, you know, you can share some of the accounts of your work at the Shur military camp, uh, Shur military camp that was set up to organize the remains of the victims. Uh, considering that you, you know, bear witness to the aftermath of many of these crimes. Okay. Um, Talia and Laura, thank you very much for making this uh, webinar and thank you for all that you're doing to, to talk about this. I, I want to just introduce myself because I think it's important that you all have the context of, of, of what I did and why I was there. I, I'm from Jerusalem. I'm originally from the States. I'm an architect by profession four children. And about 10 years ago, a unit was formed um, because so many more women were going into combat. Um, it was thought that it would be more sensitive to families um, if, if women, modern women, dealt with the burial process. Because in general, in Jewish custom, women deal with women for uh, preparation for burial and men deal with men. So that was the idea. I was asked to join this more to be part of the identification part of the process because every uh, fingerprinting and uh, ID, things like that. Um, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I am going to tell you what I saw and what our team saw. We are a team who was working uh, 24 seven, I'll get to that soon, starting October 7th. And in uh, shifts of eight hours each, um, four people to a team. Um, I am not going to um, overplay and I'm not going to underplay. I'm going to just tell you honestly, um, a lot of it is quite gruesome and um, I'm going to tell it to you. Um, when the rocket started to go off on the morning of October 7th, 
um, we don't usually use our phone as as more observant people on, on Saturday, we all turned on our phone because we started to hear many rockets and we started to hear that this was something different. And I said, this is this could be the mass casualty event that we, we never thought would happen. We used to go to training once a year. It was really something that I didn't talk about. It was just something that maybe one day, ho hopefully will never need us. It wasn't something that was, um, too much of a presence in my day-to-day -day life. Um, but starting October 7th, that night, we were already on shift. I showed up there the next day. And I must tell you that I do not have very uh, Hevra Kadisha burial society experience. I had never done this before, but it was all hands on deck. And I worked at the Shura base, which is the main rabbinate base. Um, and it's the morgue, the main morgue is there. And bodies were piled up to the ceiling. There were body bags piled up to the ceiling in every room. Trucks were coming in. It was so, it was, it was a nightmare. It was just absolutely terrible. Already the smell was very unbearable. Everybody was wearing masks. And our job was to be in the identification room where there was a forensic doctor, a dentist, an army photographer. Uh, people were to do the very good job of identification. Nobody can go to burial until there are 100% identification. A mistake cannot be made with this. Um, it's a really painstaking process. It's uh, fingerprints, dental records, and DNA. Um, in many cases, they could not do, most cases, they could not do all three of those. Um, they couldn't get the DNA, they couldn't get dental records, or they couldn't, uh, fingerprints were not possible. I'll tell you why. Uh, and I'm also sorry, because this has become very hard for me to keep retelling. I, I The first week we were there, um, almost around the clock, our teams, and in the, in the beginning, we were just doing, doing, doing. I, I I, I can't even say that emotions came into it at that point because we were just also in shock by what was happening that we we just kept working. Now, as time has gone on, I, I, I've started to realize what I saw. I'm going to tell you some of the things I saw. Um, in Jewish burial practice, um, a body is wrapped in white linen cloth Barbarians, these people, they did not treat people with respect. They, in fact, they did the opposite. They mutilated them. It was our job to treat them with the, the ultimate love. But we had bodies that were so mutilated that it was impossible to wrap them in a shroud. One, one, uh, we dealt only with female soldiers. One female soldier came in and her arm was broken in so many places. Her legs were broken in so many places that it was very difficult to put um, her body into the shroud, often we made the choice to just wrap the bodies. The entire left side of her body was blown away by a grenade. Victims were usually shot at least once in the body and then many times in the head. And that seems to have been, to shoot them so many times in the head was often a sign of just mutilation. Um, we had to put the brain back. A Jewish custom tries to keep all parts of the body so even the cloth that, that we used to, to clean away blood, we took off everybody's jewelry, we wiped, everything was blood soaked. We wiped off the jewelry, everything was saved to give back what we could for families. Um, things were dripping in blood. The body bags were still dripping three days later. I, I, forgive me for, for my gruesomeness, but I want you to know what happened. Um, it was our job to cut open these bodies. It was our job to be in the room while they were being uh, checked, their identification was being checked. Um, the idea was that we were there to, I don't know how to say this, be with them very lovingly. Um, I'm very proud of that. I have to say that we, we were there for them in that moment. Um, most of them arrived. It was awful to see. Their eyes were open. Their mouths were in a grimace. Their hands were clenched. Um, some of them were shot in the head so many times that there was no blood left. Um, you know that they were shot after they were dead because there, were, there was no blood in the wounds. 
Um, and and we clean the faces sometimes also so that if a parent, we tried to make it so that parents, if they wanted to, could see their daughters. Um, some of them came in with um, only underwear. Sometimes the underwear was bloody. Again, we are not doctors. We are not forensic people. I'm telling you what I observed. You can make your own conclusions from that. Um, people on our team, I did not see this, but my, my friends on the team right after me, a body came in with no legs, um, just cut off. Um, other people saw bodies that were mutilated, genitals were mutilated, um, limbs were cut off, eyes were crushed. Um, it was really very, very traumatic. Um, I, I'm a regular person and suddenly I was living in hell. Um, charred remains came in. Um, some of the bodies, by the time they got to us, were in advanced stages of de decomposition. Don't forget, some of the bodies um, were not, they were not able to bring them in because the places where they were getting them from were dangerous. Another time, someone came in and said to us, run, everybody run, get out, get out, get out. So we, we, I didn't know what was going on. It was very scary. It wasn't a rocket. <laughs> we're used to those. It was actually, they had booby trapped the body and they had to bring sappers to come in to, to, to check the, the grenades that were put in places in the body. That put all of our lives at risk. It almost was like they thought of everything to try to be cruel and horrible. Another time, um, someone on a team right after, soon after my shift, um, they a body came in that was full of maggots. Um, these were very, very, very difficult sights to see. All of them were very, very, very difficult sights to see. And I think our team is dealing with a lot, but I, I wanna tell you some personal vignettes from this because I think that these people, they were people to us. They weren't just, it was so easy to just make them maybe numbers to, to, to not feel. But all of a sudden I caught a glimpse um, one after another, these, these young soldiers had beautiful manicures. And you have to understand, I, I'm an architect. I deal a lot with color. And there was no color in the room. The, everybody, everything was gray or dark brown from blood. The, the tones were all dark and dreary. And all of a sudden, there were these hands with these bright, bright red or pink manicures. And at that point, I really started to cry because I thought that manicure, that moment of humanity was the hope in this, this girl, this young woman, that she was going to look beautiful and go home to her lover, her husband, her boyfriend. And that was gone. During this time, it was it was hard. We We didn't want to know too much about who we were dealing with because we were, it was the most, the biggest priority for us was to have a little bit of distance, otherwise we wouldn't have been able to go on. But I do have to tell you that when we were done with identification and we were into the um the 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 burial process, we really, really, really treated these girls like they were our daughters. And we gave them moments, their last moments with us. There was so much love in that room. And and I'm if there's anything in this whole experience that that you should just know that there was honor paid to these people by everyone on that very heroic base and is still being paid. We're still on call. We're still on an emergency footing. Um, I, I was there recently for another case. Um, we're still being, unfortunately, people are are still dying. Um, I I. I the last thing I'd, I want to tell you is that I'm a child of Holocaust survivors, and my mother was a young child um, who survived with her parents by many, many miracles. That didn't happen often in an intact family. Um, and I grew up with Holocaust stories like it was mother's milk. That was those were our family stories, and I there were no there was no filter. It was it was our life because. Almost no one survived, and the testimony was important to keep their memories alive. And my grandmother had a brother who was the youngest of seven children in her family, and he was a violinist, and he was 
At 20 years old, he was taken to Auschwitz and he was a member of the Sonderkommando. You may know that that was the unit that pulled the bodies out of the ovens. It was the worst job maybe in the concentration camps. And they they knew they they kept they only kept them in that job for a limited time and they were sentenced, they had a death sentence because they didn't want anyone to talk about that. So they killed them. We know that he was in that unit only because of testimony. There's no proof, but we know it because he was a part of the Auschwitz uprising. And I have to tell you that I, I didn't ever imagine that in my life I would be witness to horrors that were like the stories that I grew up with. And we have been. And I think more stories are coming out. Um, just recently, someone was on the base and there were two heads, just heads with knives sticking out of them. Um, I, I I have many more horrible stories, but I, I think I've given you the picture. So that's, that's, thank you for listening. Thank you, Sherry. Um... And I really echo your words on the fact that nobody in our generation would ever imagine that we would be reliving stories in our generation. Uh, we'll now turn, turn over to Professor Biton. Um, you've worked primarily internally to make sure the victims without voices are able to receive justice, if that's at all possible. Can you tell us about your efforts thus far and how you're able to communicate the atrocities while relying primarily on testimonies? Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Talia, and thank you for this uh, important event. Um, so the atrocities that uh, Hamas committed on October 7th were left, uh, left tens of thousands of survivors and victims. Some of them are direct ones and some of them are indirectly affected and have become both victims and witnesses at the same time. The atrocities are of many kinds, as all, we, all of us know, but here we want to focus on sexual assaults, which were not surfacing, um, um, you know, at the first stages of, of the war, mainly because the concept was of a, of a war zone and a terrorist event and not of a crime zone uh, or, a, or scene. Um, and in this respect, the nature of, such, of sexual assault in general is that they enjoy an inherent concealment, poten concealment uh, potential, many times because the victims are murdered after the assault, uh, but not only due to that. Uh, and when something like that happens during a war or a terror attack, the susceptibility to such concealment is even stronger. And we were determined, um, me and my friends at the commission, to not let that happen. So I wanna share with you here the scale and width of the mission of investigation that needs to be taken uh, for the October 7 events, as we have hundreds of potential witnesses that need to be questioned and provide details and testimonies about what they have witnessed. So, and each of them, uh, of these group members, you'll see, has its own limits in the potential uh, information uh, flow that they can provide. And this is something that needs to be taken into account. So if we're thinking first of the survivors, so most of the survivors are profoundly traumatized and unable to come forward and speak out. Uh, we know of cases where they already shared their lived nightmare um, including sexual assaults with trauma experts who them, assisted them uh, from their, for their mental uh, health um, issues and situation. And given that uh, sexual offenses are still strongly connected to stigma and shame, uh, we expect that uh, this is further burden, uh, burdening these victims and, and probably the survivor, the survivors uh, will be able to speak out as time um, moves forward uh, and, and their uh, ability to do that um, will be in a way um, greater. Um, the other, uh, uh, the other uh, potential witnesses are army and, sec and security forces that were first responders to the scenes. Now, many of the, of these responders, you know, who survived, who were not killed in the battlefield, are still fighting 
um, uh, on the ground and now in, in Gaza, and they're not even available for questioning. Um, the third uh, group is of civilians who were first responders, many unaccustomed with becoming witnesses and shattering their humanistic memories, if you may, as a means of, of repression uh, of, of the painful uh, memories to enable them to continue their uh, most needed work. Again, many of these people are still um, uh, very busy working to, to uh, provide a, a, um, medical assistance and so on and so forth for uh, given that we're still under uh under a, a, a war experience and and missiles falling uh hurting uh, uh people uh and so on and so forth uh medical treatment providers both on site and in hospitals are the fourth group they're still again taking care of many of those injured and hospitalized still in uh the hospitals uh in the mainly in the south of Israel and do not have the, in a way, the, the uh, you know, uh, availability to, to provide the, the, uh, the information and the testimonies. Um, the fifth group is of employees at the morgue of Shura, just like a, a Sherry here, who handled the dead bodies uh, to prepare them for identification and burial. And you have to understand that that was the main humanistic uh, um, mission that they had in that respect. Uh, that is not to say that uh, the forensic evidences were not taken uh, from the bodies, but it is definitely in a way shadowing the, the or, or halting on the, um, the endeavors that are normally taken uh, in cases of, of uh, crime investigations um, when it comes to the, the, the unbelievable and unbearable numbers of, of uh, dead people that Sherry mentioned before. So this is, you know, uh, there, are, there were also journalists who were allowed access to the scenes very shortly after the... Uh, the October 7, and um, also these people uh, can serve as as uh, witnesses. And this is a non-conclusive list of potential witnesses who are busy protecting, who were busy protecting lives, both theirs and others, while um, concentrating on their mission to bring people dead or alive to safe spaces. These people were acting as professionals, but became, in many of the cases, the only living witnesses of the victims who were eventually uh, murdered. And this is something that we know from uh, other uh, cases of, of uh, war zones where women uh, were raped, not as, not as a means to impregnate them, but rather as a means to humiliate them and to humiliate the nations that they belong to, and then um, to have them murdered, not to, to be able to provide uh, the evidences that, that are needed allegedly to to uh, prosecute the uh, the offenders and the terrorists. The immediate necessity to collect these testimonies is also restrained by the need to treat these witnesses as quasi victims. Really, I go back again to, to Sherry's uh, uh, depiction, which was, you know, it was so hard for, for Sherry and for all of us. And you, in a way, Sherry has become uh, a type of a secondary uh, victim traumatized by by the horrors that she witnessed that she has never witnessed before because all these people uh, have been exposed to atrocities unknown in scale and gravity to Israelis. This warrants utilizing the assistance of uh, accompanying of uh, uh, professionals specializing in secondary victimhood um, who are supposed to make sure that no secondary harm will be caused in addition uh, uh, to what they have already endured in the process of providing these testimonies. So all of these uh, characteristics of what Israel is uh, faced with here require extreme caution in conducting these investigations and also requires the patience uh, of, of, of the world in accordance with that.
Thank you so much, Professor Beaton. Uh, indeed, patience is something we must all have as we continue this, this uh, process that nobody knows how long it will take. Uh, Dr. Elkham Levy, your work has focused on giving these victims a voice abroad. Can you tell us about the evolution of the commission you head, what the response in the international forums have been thus far, and what you really expect from the global community? Yes, thank you. I'm still even thinking about Sherry's uh, uh, testimony, and it's uh, me and Ifat were talking uh, that it confirms some of the things that we've heard, but we weren't sure, but just to hear it from her, it's... Uh, uh, anyway, thank you so much for hosting this event. Um, I want to also thank Sherry for this testimony, for, for repeating it for all of us. Uh, I wrote every word, and we're going to archive this uh, testimony also. Um, and also my colleague, uh, Professor Ifat Beaton, who leads with me the, the commission uh, and has been a force uh, ever since the, the beginning of this, uh, of this war. So... <sighs> Before I start, I just want to say something I think very basic, uh, because I've uh, I've had several interviews during the past uh, two days and uh, overall uh, in the past month, and I want to explain something very basic. I'm an international law uh, professor, and there is no question that there have been war crimes and crimes against humanity, the mass atrocities. Uh, that have happened here in Israel are no doubt a violation of international law, international humanitarian law. Um, the, the fact, even before any investigation, the magnitude of the crimes uh, is unquestionable. It's not even, a, it's not even a, a something that we debate among ourselves whether there have been war crimes or not, whether there have been uh, crimes against humanity, there have been crimes against humanity. The reason uh, it's important to collect all these testimonies to uh, uh, to um, bring, uh, to conduct the investigation um, is, is so justice will be, uh, will be done with the victims. Okay, and the reason we want to check whether there has been sexual assault and to what extent and to what scale is to, so we'll be able to tell the stories, the specific stories of, of, of these crimes. So there is no question that there have been war crime, horrific war crimes, brutal attack that constitute a violation of uh, the Rome Statute of Geneva Conventions. And, and so I want to just start with that because I feel like it has been uh, repeating. And so the reason we are conducting all of this is just to bring justice to the victims, to make sure we also recognize the crimes committed against women and children, as this is our field of expertise. So, and now let me start uh, again. So as uh, Talia said, my name is Dr. Kochav Kayam Levy. I'm uh, I'm a researcher at uh, a professor at Hebrew U, uh, University in the International Relations Department, uh, and I chair the Civil Commission on October Seventh Crime by Hamas against uh, women and children. So we established the the commission on the eighth day of the war as more and more uh, evidence. Uh, of brutal crimes against women and children emerged. Um, we are, I'll just say that uh, we are an independent uh, group uh, of, of experts. We are non-governmental. We do not work for the government. We have no, um, anyway, um, obligation towards uh, the government. We were, um, so I just want to um, establish that. And so, um, we are a group of legal professionals, academic uh, researchers, experts in international law, humanitarian law, human rights law, victimology, and gender-based violence, together with representatives of Israeli women's rights organizations. Uh, if you need our mission statement, uh, I'll send it to you. So we came together really uh, with the purpose of gathering and distributing authentic, credible information, providing expert advice, advocating for and really initiating actions related to the collection of evidence and testimonies on sexual and other uh, crimes committed against uh, uh, women and children. 
and maybe a word on that when I when we talk about gender based crimes, it's not only sexual uh, crimes. Um, it, it's not only sexual violence, even cutting uh, women's organs uh, or as uh, Sherry mentioned, putting a grenade in a woman's bodies uh, or or killing um, uh, in front of uh, killing a baby in front of uh, his mother, or killing parents in front of their children, uh, or mothers in front of their children, and kidnapping women and children. They are all gender-based violence. Um, so I want to put that in mind. It's not only the sexual abuse or specific uh, uh, and, and this specificity. Um, and so during the past few weeks, we addressed local and international bodies regarding those issues, watching footage and videos broadcasted um, hundreds, thousands of thousands of videos on social uh, media were uh, broadcasted by Hamas in real time during October 7th. It already showed clear violations, as I said, of international law and brutal crimes committed against women and children. So it was clear to me and to many other uh, of my peers at the commission that we need to take action. Uh, so at this point, to our deep of, uh, surprise, at the very first week of the uh, attack, despite what we already knew, despite the the multiple um, the multiple uh, uh, videos that were were shown and. Uh, no international recognition or condemnation, condem uh, condemning of the specific crimes against women and children was published. Therefore, we took upon ourselves to call for recognition and actions to specifically address our co colleagues at the UN, uh, the colleagues that are working on on gender-based issues, the UN Women, the CEDAW Committee, CEDAW Committee is the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. It's an experts committee, uh, experts just like us, professors uh, that are, are uh, prominent scholars in feminist theory and international law. And so we thought that we're gonna address them and send them information. We um, So that's, that's the first thing that we do. We also realized very quickly that we have another mission and this is that uh, the, these crimes against women and children here must be documented and brought uh, again uh, to the attention of the international uh, community so what we already did we reached out with information to numerous relevant international bodies 160 international law and human rights experts and many women's rights organizations uh, have joined the appeals we sent them brief reports um, calls for action, giving them information as credible as uh, as we could not, uh, as Sherry said, it was important for us to um, not exaggerate, but just write what we know. And we knew already a lot. I'm looking at what we wrote at the second week. I'm just, I'm shocked. Uh, and so thousands uh, of, uh, of women signed these uh, uh, the, the civil petition. Additionally, as equally important, the commission move on, moved on, as I said, to uh, gather and create credible database. Um, we have uh, we are now working on a, an archive that will translate into several reports uh, to ensure um, that the seventh of October crimes uh, against women will never be forgotten, and then also that their stories will be adequately told because we know that um, the stories about these crimes tend to uh, be manipulated for different reasons. So we wanted to be the voice of, of these women. Um, another important aspect, as you heard from uh, from Ifat, was to provide guidance to Israeli authorities regarding the gender-based violence aspects of the investigation, including on trauma-informed investigation, response to survivors, and gathering testimonies on, on these war crimes against women. And um, that's, uh, that's our... That's in overall uh, of what we just do. So to mention very briefly, just a fraction of what we know. And um, I think I spoke with a few of you, I just told uh, what I shared is that we already have much more information that we can share until we confirm it. But uh, what uh, was read at the beginning collected by the commission is only uh, really a not all the information that we have. We are also respecting the families. Some of them do not know 
um, what the, we want to be very respectful of their the victims. A lot of the information, as I said, um, was uh, provided to uh, uh, was already published to the international media, but the Israeli public here uh, knows much less than you do. It knows much less than we do uh, because we access uh, international media, and so because of the families, uh, much of the information is being. Um, I was being, uh, I forgot the word, but we, we just uh, really want to be careful with what uh, with what we say uh, for to respect the, the families and and their um, and their experience. So the evidence of the magnitude and the brutality of the sexual and gender based violence perpetrated by, by Hamas is really overwhelming, um, and uh, we cor uh, corroborated by multiple sources. As I said, even now we heard. Uh, another person testimony testifying on uh, reporting to us on what Sherry just said, and now we're hearing Sherry telling her experience leaving the room because of what was found in this uh, uh, in the body of this soldier, uh, female soldier. Um, it's just uh, so it's it's a good dem demonstration of what happens to us. Um, and I will brief, briefly review uh, the chronology according to the order in which uh, this um, evidence comes came to our uh, became available available to us. So the first evidence uh, emerged as early as the morning as of Saturday uh, of October seventh during the attack themselves. As I said, as Hamas proudly posted live images and live streamed videos of the attack on social media. Uh, these included video images, for instance, of a young Israeli woman at the at the music festival, stripped naked, pushed to the ground with a Hamas terrorist raping her and doing other unspeakable horrors. Some of these videos were sadistically sent by Hamas to the families of the victims themselves using the victims' own phones. Next came the reports of eyewitnesses, multiple survivors from Nova Music Festival reporting, or other um, survivors reporting, um, but I'll just refer to Nova first, uh, the Nova Music Festival reporting that they witnessed women uh, being raped around them as they themselves were hiding from uh, for their lives in the bushes, trying to avoid detection by terrorists. Um, and other survivors shared similar stories from around the southern part of Israel, not only from the Nova party, from uh, from the kibbutzim and the communities around um, around there. So next came also images of the bodies of the victims. Some of them were also, uh, as I said, some of the images were uh, as early as uh, October 7th. Um, and the bodies of the victims in the aftermath of the festival, we saw, for example, women stripped from the waist down legs spread apart, uh, abused and murdered, their mutilated bodies uh, left to die uh, in the sand, uh, burned bodies of women, uh, burned bodies partially burned. I'll just leave it there. Um, next came the first responders, uh, including the report of a paramedic who entered a home uh, in Berry to see a 14 year old girl uh, raped and murdered on the floor of her bedroom, stripped from the waist down, legs wide open with semen uh, detected on her back. She was left, uh, uh, she was, he, he reported that she was left, uh, shot in her head and left a puddle of her own blood. Next came forensic workers, including Sherry, um, people who dealt with the bodies uh, from whom we just, uh, uh, from Sherry, who we just heard. Uh, who details stories of women of all ages uh, being raped, um, rapes of such uh, savage brutality, um, and even uh, vaginal bleeding uh, that they broke bones, including pelvic bones. Then came the video testimonies of Hamas terrorists themselves. We received more and more videos that we didn't have, uh, that we didn't, uh, we asked people to go over telegrams. Um, all because it was hard for us to see so many, as I think Talia mentioned, we are already, or even Ifat mentioned, we are already victims uh, of of watching so many of these horrible uh, images and um, and uh, videos. So uh, we got uh, 
uh, videos so, uh, that show Hamas terrorists uh, themselves openly and, and from the investigation openly admitting and bragging that their mission, their mission was to rape and to dirty Israeli women and girls, to rape and murder babies. They even explained that they received uh, permission to, pe uh, to perpetrate these horrific acts from their religious leaders, as I mentioned uh, on Sunday, uh, whoever of you joined the event there, in order to instill uh, fear uh, in the Israeli uh, public. So next uh, to your question, Talia, um, what has been uh, the reaction from partners in international organizations? So I must admit, I'm sometimes at a loss of of, of word on this, uh, despite, uh, as I said, despite years of progress of so many resolutions and articles and um, and commentary on gender-based violence against women internationally and the fact that Hamas footage was available online for anyone uh, to watch already on uh, 7th of October, the international community, of, um, on, uh, or specifically, it, it has kept silent on the crimes against women and children. Unfortunately, even with respect to women's organizations, uh, such as, as I said, UN Women in CEDO, um, they failed to even uh, recognize the heinous crimes that we're, that we're facing. Uh, the failure to condemn these crimes really, I want to say, as an international law expert, it undermines um, the legitimacy of, of global institutions. It allows for further violations, not just Israel, but globally. Uh, the fact that they are not reporting very uh, on these um, on these atrocities, it's just, it's really unbelievable. It's really something that we can't really um, explain. Some of you uh, re requested my explanation, so. I say I think um, the the week, if any response by the international uh, community, just serves really as a fertile ground for the continuing weaponization of women and girls' bodies in warfare, fair as we have witnessed, and um, and Hamas might be now denying these crimes, but during the attack and immediately after Hamas and its terrorists released horrific visuals of the crimes, um, but. Um, it, it it did it so quickly. It it broadcasted the crimes, but then uh, denied them. But it, it was not only that Hamas was denying these crimes. Uh, I as I said, we as Israeli really feel that we are subject to a collective denial. The evidence, as I as I say, are so um, you 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 saw more than us. Uh, it's really undeniable that we find ourselves fighting this dual battle, one against these atrocities and another against global uh, yeah. silence. I'll just very quickly just say that uh, there is no way to justify the crimes. There is no privilege to ignore what happened or to be selective in view of the identity of the victims. Uh, it seems easier to, to ignore also sexually inflicted war crimes as if the same denial mechanisms inflicted on individual rape victims are now inflicted against all of us, women, girls, mothers, sisters, and daughters in Israel. And so... Um, uh, if you, uh, I think if you want to ask me what do I expect from the international community, I'll just say in two words, uh, unconditional humanity. Uh, unconditional humanity, and this is uh, what I think uh, was missing. One last uh, thought that I wanted to share. The fact that there's no recognition is is creating such collateral damage because it affects, it, it really neglects women here in Israel, um, civil society organizations that need need the international community now by its, by its side. I'm uh, working and with, with the feminist uh, and women's rights organization here in Israel and they are struggling, struggling to help women survivors, struggling to help women who were evacuated from their houses, struggling to support them and to support um, the multiple aspects uh, of women, women during war. And uh, I can elaborate on that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for, thank you so much for all of you uh, sharing, sharing these most difficult things. 
Um, I'd like to go to questions. And firstly, I'd like to go, Sherry, to you. Um, I, I know that this must have taken an incredible, uh, difficult, emotional toll on you. And I just wanted to ask, uh, which a question we got from someone who's listening right now, is there any psychological assistance provided to those involved in the identification process and the documentation? And and I know you've shared some very difficult things that you've seen. Sherry? First of all, I really, I appreciate so much that your audience cares. I, I can't tell you how touching that is because I, I feel that um, we are working in this field of, of horror and it's nice to know that people are recognizing how difficult this is. So I just want to say, first of all, I really, really, really appreciate that. Um, I don't think we're allowing ourselves to really feel yet because we want to still be effect effective. There are still families of people, there are still bodies that have not been identified, not for lack of trying, um, but because it's almost impossible to identify shards of bone, that's all that's left. The people they're going through piles to see if they can find um, teeth to see if they can be recognized by dentists. So there are still people, there are still families, parents, uh, spouses, children waiting to, to know if their loved one is kidnapped or dead. So until that is done, I don't feel like I have the right to do anything but help these families, not because I'm a martyr, but because that's our job. And, you know, even as a civilian who came into this unwittingly, um, we'll worry about ourselves later. I do want to answer the question, though. The Army has very, very generously right away offered us psychological help. Um, we've met with us. Our whole group has met with a psychologist on Zoom. They've offered us many, many, many ways to help us. I think by and large, though, our group is strong and we're very dedicated to the family. And even the young dentists who I've met, many of them are women who are in their 20s and their 30s, and they've, they're have they all in the identification room and they've seen awful, awful, awful sights. There are many people who it's torture to try to get their, their the x-rays on them. And I said to them, you know, I'm twice your age. Uh, I've seen more. How are you doing? Like to think about a 30 year old woman doing this is very difficult. And they, they have the same answer. They said, we're not going to start to feel yet. We're strong, we're dedicated to these families and our country, and we are going to deal with our heads later. The whole country has to deal with their heads. So we will, our, we're doing a job and we're very dedicated, but thank you though for the caring, so. Thank, thank you so much for that, Sherry. Uh, Professor Beaton, um, this is a question that I've been asked, I'm sure you've been asked, and it, it, it's going to be very difficult for me to present this, and um, I apologize in advance, but do you have patholo pathology reports or CSI evidence so that we can provide evidence specifically of sexual assault? Is that something that that has been done? I think what is important to to know is that we need to acknowledge that these things have happened. There are multiple evidences indicating that this has happened. Uh, my friend Kohav here was, you know, reading Apple uh, testimonies, uh, as well as uh, Talia did this as well. Sherry provided some. So there are different types of evidence that can be uh, used to to prove the fact that this has happened. But as Kohab said, uh, and I recite her, this has happened and we have evidences to show that this has happened. Do we have the specific evidences that are, you know, uh, um, what we call forensic evidence? So uh, clearly the, the work of collecting evidence is still taking place. And there are multiple ways of looking at evidence this way, these days. Um, think of digital means that can be used uh, to, to uh, sort out 
the 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 around what we know now is around fifty thousand footage uh, um, uh, digital evidence uh, that is a uh, that is roaming uh, um, in many places, and there are many archives that use them. Um, and we know also that in Shua, for example, there were not only uh, the dentists but also pathologists that were uh, um, uh, working there as well. Um, and as you well know, when it comes to legal investigations, the, the, the idea is not to take out the, uh, you know, partial evidence and, and just uh, uh, show it to the public, but rather to try and do it carefully and respectfully and in a manner that would allow the police, mainly the police, to do its job and later on uh, the um, the uh, attorney general to take it to, to the courts and to bring justice. So there is in a way some kind of, of conflict here between the, the need of people to see very specific evidence as to or uh, in, in contrast to the interest of doing justice. So in this regard, I think that focusing on specific uh, evidence and not in a way um, settling for ample others that we cannot uh, now control and that they are already out there um, is in this respect, um, not something that we should cater to, not something that we should uh, uh, busy ourselves with. I think that most of our of our efforts should be concentrated in acknowledging uh, the the huge range of atrocities that have happened, some of which are sexual assaults, and not you know it should not be confined uh, confined to to rapes only, but also to other types of, of uh, gender-based assaults and to condemn it unequivocally. Thank you, Professor Beaton. And, and one final question to you, Dr. el -Yakim. Um First of all, you seemed like you had something to add there at the end of Professor Beaton, but I also, uh, we got a question here and and this I think is is very important to relate to. And she said that she understands how important it is, of course, to protect the families of victims. But these films and these testimonies need to be shown on legitimate platforms. How can this happen? Should it happen? Um, what can we do to bring everything that all three of you have said to to the public forefront? And and really, you know, we're all faced with so much denial and so much prove it, prove it. Um, is this something that you can see happening? Of course. So it actually relates to what I wanted to add to Professor Bitton. So I'm listening to both of us, me and Ifat. Uh, we go together from the first day of the war. And um, we didn't sound that this way. We, um, I, I can, as I, as I shared, um, international media and Israeli media approached us. Uh, we were in such, uh, we were under pressure to provide all the details we knew and we were so careful. Uh, I could have, I, we could have had any platform we've chosen to, to come and say that there, there has been sexual violence uh, in this and this magnitude very early at war. Everybody wanted to, to know this. Everybody called us a few times a day. I couldn't even, um, I shared with my colleagues, it, it's insane. I can't even use my phone. So you need to understand that what we're saying now is a process uh, of understanding the magnitude of the event. Um, so seeing Ifa telling you, this oh, has yeah. happened, this has happened so many times, it's of even reflecting on our process as legal experts, uh, going through this process, and I want to bring one one example. We've heard uh, from the in, in the first week of the war of a pregnant woman uh, found slaughtered. It was um, it was broadcasted in in international media. So and and in the second week, and and we were shocked. We we're like, is it? Could it be that they took a baby out of a of a woman's womb? 
and, and then the second week of the war, we've heard about it from the rescue teams. We got a report that the rescue team collected the body of a woman or and, and, and the baby. And the third week, uh, or a few days afterwards, we got the information from Shura from the, the of, of treating the body of, of this woman. And the most terrible thing uh, is that last week, we got the video. We got the video uh, of this woman. Now, and I wanna, um, maybe it will um, reflect on everything. So I didn't know what really happened to her. We, we could only imagine, but to, to uh, see the video, I didn't see it. I had a person next to me describing exactly what it is. I couldn't watch it. I was alive. I, I didn't imagine that she was alive. I don't know. I just imagined that she was dead while they did it. Um, but covered that she was alive. She had her mouth um, covered uh, with uh, something. Her breasts were cut. Um, um, her breasts were cut. The, while she was screaming and tortured, the baby, they, they cut it up. Uh, uh, they cut open her belly. I couldn't really um, um, under, understand that this has happened. So we know of these bodies of women without uh, underwear, and we might never find the videos showing the horrors that they've been through uh, as what happened with these pregnant women and the multiple sources uh, that came into this, um, this horrible evidence of what she's been through. Um, and I don't want to even think about when her family is going to find out if they found out, uh, but it's just describing the process we had. Uh, and we have many of these reports, um, many uh, examples of these reports of uh, things happening to women that I didn't share because we didn't, uh, we, we still unfolding all the, uh, but what I shared uh, already and what uh, um, uh, Laura read uh, was just, uh, as I said, example of what happened. And so um, and so this is uh, what I wanted to say. And, and as to the question whether it's going to be used, of course, the videos are going to be brought to, to the courts. Of course, they have to see to see it. Of course, they need to. It's, it's going to happen. It's uh, I, we, we're going to see several tribunals. We're going to see uh, courts in other countries. So uh, and because uh, we had foreign nationals involved in this atro in, in the atrocities, so they're going to bring their charges in other countries. We know that families have already are already represented uh, in the ICC in the International uh, Criminal Court. They already uh, um, independently approach the ICC. We know of the ICC prosecutor already expressing. Um, sorry of the atrocities that happened here and it's in uh, and acknowledging the, the the immense suffering of uh, of thousands of uh, civilians here in Israel and uh, expressing interest in um I would say investigating uh what happened here um and and so Israel would uh, um, the state of Israel I assume um would um, uh, also consider uh, its uh, its path of bringing these uh, uh, these these atrocities to international courts, and of course, all these evidences are going to be considered. It's not like uh, I want to say you compare it to criminal national criminal courts, but international court is uh, tribunals. Uh, it's very different, um, and especially in such atrocities, there are multiple. Uh, um, thousands of evidence it's not something that is collected um in in such a someone asked is there was there a rape kit <laughs> it's as i said uh this is these are not national courts uh the procedures are different the magnitude of the events uh are already enough evidence of uh, of the violation of every uh international uh law the reason war crimes and crimes against humanity. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. And one final uh, quick question for you, Professor Beton. Even with all the forensic evidence, 
Won't it be impossible to prosecute Hamas perpetrators or even Gaza civilians who perpetrated these acts? And how will we know who the perpetrators actually are? Uh, so again, you know, there are the there are multiple uh, um, authorities that are uh, handling this case. Uh, one of them is the um, is the one that's interrogating the terrorists themselves, and uh, um, other bodies are interrogating uh, the scene uh, in a way and witnesses. Um, and these are questions that are relevant to all cases where you have uh, mass atrocities, um, multiple um, perpetrators, and the question is, who's to be blamed for what? So in in one aspect of this uh, um, query, the, the answer is that it's easier to do that in the sense that there are uh, all kinds of, uh, or types of uh, criminal liabilities that are related and emanating from the fact that people uh, work as complicits um, and aiding and abating and and uh, and so on and so forth. So you don't have to to identify a specific perpetrator, but definitely in some of the uh, evidence that we that we hold, uh, it's easy to identify the specific people. There's also the collective. Um, um, plea and, and legal claim that can be brought to um, to international tribunals. Um, and there are, a, there are cases that are going to be tried under Israeli law because many of the atrocities were committed on Israeli land and territory, um, which provides jurisdiction to, to the state of Israel and its uh, uh, legal system. So there are many uh, multiple legal mechanisms that are going to be uh, uh, affected here, and different ones can address a uh, different uh, set of evidence that we have uh, in order to to bring justice to the victims. That is actually all the time that we have left today, Professor Ifat Biton, Dr. Kochav, Elkayam Levy, mm -hmm. and Sherry. And of course, uh, thank you to Laura, my colleague. Um, really just, uh, just not one of the webinars we had ever wanted to host. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you for your words and your courage and uh, just your sacrifice, really. Uh, if anybody has any follow-up questions, you're welcome to send us an email. I've popped up uh, our email addresses in the chat box. Um, and uh, I think that is the end of our call. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. So important. Good night. Thank you, Sherry. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Wow. We saw you and you're... Thank you so much.